It's uh, my honor to uh, welcome you all to the uh, 11th uh, Rosenthal Memorial Lecture. Uh, first, I want to thank a few people. I want to thank the Rosenthal family and other donors for making this possible. Uh, I want to thank GEA, uh, Sarah Mikado, and Ben Solo, and Alex uh, Potterak, and I hope I didn't leave somebody out. That would be bad. Uh, for, uh, for all their work organizing, and uh, of course, uh, Norma Hardeo for being the, uh, the driving force year after year in uh, putting this together and, uh, and organizing. Uh, and also, uh, I want to thank Phil Rennie for coming out today to, uh, to speak. I, it's not my job to introduce him, uh, but uh, I can't refrain from saying that uh, I think you're in for a treat today because Phil is, a, is really an excellent speaker. Uh, I, th I think he's extremely clear, largely because I think he thinks extremely clearly. Um, I think this is probably why, why he and Bob Rosenthal got along very well. Bob was also somebody who kind of uh, saw the key uh, points right away and uh, didn't, uh, didn't uh, waste time on a lot of side issues. Um, I was not uh, fortunate enough to have Bob as a colleague. Uh, but uh, I believe that I have the honor of being the, uh, the last person to have been uh, hired by him. Uh, it, was, uh, it was Bob and, and uh, Christoph that uh, convinced me to come out and give a job talk, uh, even though I was uh, happy at uh, Wisconsin. Uh, and it was the appeal of uh, being colleagues with Bob that, uh, that convinced me to accept the offer in uh, January of 2002. And uh, just a few weeks later, uh, we got the news that, that Bob passed away. Uh, I, I vividly remember sitting in my office in Madison, uh, just stunned by this uh, news and thinking, should I really be going <laughs> to be you? Uh, Bob's not there. And I, I thought about it and I realized that, uh, that Bob would not have wanted me to, to, uh, to change my mind. Uh, and that if it had been different, if it had been him in that situation, he wouldn't have changed his mind. So, so here I am. Um, the other memory of Bob that I want to mention is uh, one time in 1998 uh, visiting uh, Jerusalem, Hebrew University. I think Phil was there too. I, I think we only overlapped a couple of days though. And uh, I remember uh, <clears throat> this was the, uh, the summer before I was moving to Wisconsin. Uh, and I moved a few times in the preceding few years and so I was getting a bit of teasing about this. And so we got into this discussion of, you know, who was the economist that had the largest number of quote unquote permanent uh, positions? Uh, and uh, Bob had moved several times before coming to BU. So it occurred to me that maybe, maybe Bob would, would win this honor. And uh, so I sort of went over jokingly and was asking him about this. And I was surprised because he was, he was, he was almost a little offended by this. And uh, he explained that you know, he'd been at BU a number of years at that point, and, and he really considered BU home. Uh, and I, think, I think this department meant a lot to Bob, and, and Bob meant a lot to, to this department. So I think it's very fitting that, that uh, we do what we can to commemorate uh, his great career here. And I, think it's, I, I wish I could claim credit for coming up with the idea of the way we do it. I, I, I think it's just exactly what Bob would have wanted. So the, the graduate students select the speaker, uh, the speaker spends a lot of time with the graduate students talking to them about their research, uh, which is something Bob certainly would have wanted to do. Uh, and then, of course, at the end, we get uh, a, a great presentation by a great economist, something else Bob would have enjoyed. So uh, with that, I will turn things over to Francesco Di Carolis to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, Bart. It's my great honor and pleasure to introduce you, Phil Rennie, who will give uh, this Rosenthal lecture today. And the reason why I've been given this honor to introduce Phil uh, is that Phil was uh, one of the members of my thesis committee at Chicago. And so in the spirit of this Rosenthal lecture in which the guest speaker spent so much time with the students and the students are a major part of this event, uh, I have the occasion to tell you something about uh, feel that you are not able to read from his CV or from reading his publications. And um, let me tell you that also like I shared the three anecdotes that I'm about to tell you with the other students of Phil that overlap with me at Chicago, Amit Gandhi at Wisconsin, Yukio Koriyama at Paris School of Economics, Francesco Nava at LSC, and uh, Priscilla Mann at Queensland, and we all shared very similar experience and very positive experience, so nothing to be embarrassed about. <laughs> so 
But in telling you these three anecdotes, um, I really hope that um, you internalize this fact and then you start to expect from us faculty, from me, this kind of treatment that I receive at Chicago. And uh, it's also good to tell you so that also I remember how sh I should treat students always. So <clears throat> the first episodes happen in one of the first meetings I had with Phil um, when he became part of my uh, advisor's panel. And uh, I, don't, I think it was the second meeting. So I arrived there at the scheduled time, but inside the office with Phil, there was one of the many big names that populate the Chicago Department of Economics. They were having a big discussion about some major idea, I don't know what. And so as a young student, uh, instead of knocking at the door and saying, this is my time slot, I remained outside the door and I waited. I waited maybe 40 minutes. Then <clears throat> when finally I entered into the office, Phil told me something about, weren't you supposed to come earlier? And I said, I was outside, I was waiting for you to finish. And he said, never do this again. The time slot was yours. And he really meant this. And uh, that was not something obvious. I mean, at Chicago, there was maybe somewhere else as well. I was a student only there, so I cannot tell about other places. But whenever you are a student, especially at the beginning, it's pretty hard uh, to get um, the faculty to know you well and to respect you at the beginning. Then through time, absolutely, you get the respect. Uh, Phil was unusual in that, in the sense that he was willing to give you credit at the beginning, but then when maybe other faculty start to trust you maybe too much, so your proof is right, your reasoning is right, Phil will not give you this trust afterwards. You will always have to earn it. And so this is the first story. Um, the second story is very much related and is the experience of having Phil uh, as uh, a member of this thesis committee. And uh, <clears throat> I would say that only thanks to Phil, I was sure that what I wrote in that thesis was actually correct and that the proofs and the theorems were correct and were not made up because he had the time and patience to go over proof in reading them. And uh, also all the discussions we had were extremely informative because a discussion with Phil typically meant spending a lot of time on the framework of the problem, on the assumptions underlying this problem, and never jumping to the results. Like a bad habit that maybe also I have sometimes is in trying to think too fast and jumping at the conclusion of what the student is or the researcher is trying to do, which is typically wrong. With Phil, all the speech was based on the initial framework so that then once this was clear, he could arrive to the conclusions. And if your conclusion were different from the ones of Phil, typically the one who was wrong <laughs> was not Phil. <laughs> and um, the third episode connects extremely well to what Bart was saying and is about clarity. So I was your student in two classes, uh, game theory in the first year, and then this beautiful class uh, on uh, social choice um, and mechanism design in uh, my second year. And in this uh, advanced uh, class on economic theory, the typical comment at the end of the class between uh, the, uh, the group of us attending was, I just wish that that paper was written by Fiorani <laughs> instead of the other. Because the clarity with which Phil was able to transmit uh, the content and the important uh, message of the paper was really remarkable. And in the years at Chicago, Phil was uh, among the very, very best, uh, very, very best uh, teachers in terms of able, being able to explain concept to all of us. And this is all very important. And as Bart was saying, this is associated with clarity of thinking. Clarity of explaining always goes with clarity of thinking. And uh, <clears throat> although I didn't have the fortune to meet Bob Rosenthal, in my understanding, uh, Bob Rosenthal shared this characteristic with Phil, uh, and he was able to transmit uh, in a very clear way his ideas. Uh, and uh, I asked Bart if this is correct. He said, so, so I can say. So Bob Rosenthal uh, uh, invented uh, the centipede game as a way to explain backward induction reasoning and to address issues with backward induction. 
And uh, the Centivert game is now a tool that you find in every textbook of game theory. And that's become so important because it's such a simple and clear framework that in a such forceful way gives you the idea of what backward induction is. This is the kind of reasoning that also Phil is able to use and transmit. And uh, in terms of academic research, uh, the academic contributions of Phil are just uh, enormous in many areas of theory. Uh, some of them uh, also overlap with uh, Bob Rosenthal, for instance, in terms of uh, uh, purification results, uh, study of auctions, uh, and but today what we are going to see is probably the area on which Phil has focused most of his uh, academic production and is about existence of equilibria. No need to say how essential the idea of existence is uh, for everything that is done in theory, so let me not take more time and let me give you here this lecture by Phil Rennie, the William C. Nervy professor at the University of Chicago. Thanks, Bart and Francesco, for uh, that uh, really very generous introduction um, that just uh, reminds us all again, it's, it's, uh, it, it's great to have brilliant graduate students with, with uh, selective memories. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Um, so now I want to thank the, uh, the Graduate Economics Association for inviting me to give uh, the uh, Robert W. Rosenthal lecture. Uh, so thank you, uh, uh, Ben, Sarah, and Alex. And it was a pleasure to speak to all the graduate students today. I, 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 I'm sure there are more of you, but the, the bunch that I spoke with today uh, uh, were really terrific, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a sign uh, that, that uh, you know, really good things are happening here at BU. Um, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, whether the graduate committee knew it, and, and Francesco touched upon it, you know, uh, uh, but but Bob had a, a real influence on on um, my thinking from very early on. Uh, as as Francesco mentioned, Bob uh, you know, invented this uh, uh, important game of perfect information, uh, which um, illustrated the sometimes very counterintuitive. Uh, uh, results of backward induction. The, the game is called, actually Rosen, now called Rosenthal Centipede Game. And um, this was actually back in the early 80s. And, and uh, this was, uh, had a big influence on me, in fact, and, and um, led me to study uh, common knowledge of rationality in extensive form games, which ultimately was the topic of my dissertation. So. Um, you know, Bob, uh, his work on auctions and game theory and, and uh, um, uh, bargaining theory, the revelation principle, I mean, it's had a tremendous influence on the profession and, and me personally. Um, and, you know, Bob, of course, was an was a, a important contributor to, to not only um, modeling games and applied theory, but, but really fundamental contributions to theory. And so, so for me, it's especially um, uh, gratifying to, to give a lecture today on a, on a fundamental problem in game theory, which is the problem of existence of sequential equilibrium in, in games with uh, infinite uh, actions and, and, uh, and, and types. Um, and this is joint work with, with Roger Meyerson, also at, uh, at Chicago. Um, so let, let me begin by trying to, to illustrate what I think the fundamental problem is. And I should say that, that, that you know, a lot of this, the nitty gritty details here are technical, but today, you know, that's, we're, it's not about the, 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 the technical stuff. I'd, be, I'd be happy to talk about technical things. Um, uh, at dinner or at the bar, wherever you want, but, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about examples. We, we'll, we, we won't avoid all technicalities today, but we'll keep those really in the background if we can. Let me give you an example um, that, that really is the, the heart of the matter. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a simple game that you'd think that, boy, you know, we really ought to be able to analyze this one. This should be a cakewalk, but actually uh, it, it just isn't. So. Um, this is a four-player game. There are going to be two dates at which actions take place. Uh, date one, uh, player one makes a choice from the 
in interval of minus one, one. So he chooses a real number between minus one and one. Um, and he's the only player that will have infinitely many actions. So player two, also at date one, simultaneously chooses either left or right. Uh, at date two, uh, players three and four, they'll observe the date one choices of, of players one and two, and they'll simultaneously choose left, right. So in terms of the structure of a game, couldn't be simpler. Two players choose simultaneously at date one, their choices are revealed, and two players, uh, other players choose simultaneously at date two. Simple as that. Um, but, 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 so what are the payoffs here? Um, let's start with players three and four. Their payoffs are the simplest. So what are their payoffs? Well, uh, it's written there, but let me say it in a slightly different way. All they care about in terms, their incentives are determined just by what player one does. Player one is choosing a number, uh, either uh, a negative number or a positive number. So either a number to the left of zero or to the right of zero or zero. If player one chooses a number to the left of zero, both players three and four strictly want to choose left. Okay, so that is to say if A1 is negative, so if, if, if player one chooses a negative number, then their payoff is minus, well that's a positive number if they choose left, and it would be negative if they choose right. So if player one chooses a number to the left of zero, then three and four strictly want to choose left. If he chooses, player one chooses a number to the right of zero, three and four strictly want to choose right. If player one chooses zero, then they're indifferent, both of them are indifferent between left and right. Okay, so their decision is trivial, okay? And it has only to do with what one does. Okay, sorry. Uh, what about player two's payoff? Player two, what she would like to do, remember she's choosing at date one, okay? So she's either choosing left or right. And what she wants to do is to predict what player three in, at date uh, two will do, okay? So she, she would like to match. So player one, if play, player two chooses left, uh, she does better if three chooses left uh, than right. If player two chooses right, then she does better if two, uh, three chooses right rather than left. So, so, in, so what are the exact payoffs? Uh, these details will matter a little bit in a moment, so we'll go over them. So if two chooses left, then she'll get a payoff of one if three chooses left, but minus one if three chooses right. So she wants to match three. Um, if two chooses right, then, then uh, she will get a payoff of two, a, a better payoff. If three chooses right, so that's a match, and minus two if three chooses left. Okay, so, so two wants to, to match what player three will eventually do. Okay, what about uh, one's payoff? Well, one's payoff is the sum of three terms. Uh, the first term is, well, one would like three and four to match, to do the same thing. Uh, and if they do match, that is either both play left or both play right, then he gets 10. If they mismatch, he gets uh, nothing out of that first component. Second term, so plus he'll get uh, another payoff if what? Well, he, he, he wants, two and three to mismatch. So remember, player two would like to match three. Player one actually would like two to mismatch with three. And if two and three uh, match, on the other hand, he'll get minus the absolute value of his action, so something negative if he's chosen a non-zero action. And if they mismatch, this is good for player one, he'll get uh, the absolute value of his action. Okay, so, so if he hasn't chosen a zero action, player one would like two and three to, to mismatch. And finally, uh, well, it's costly for him to take a non-zero action. He gets minus the absolute value as action squared. So those are the three terms that make up one's payoff. Okay, so, so the gist of it is that, that, that um, players three and four, all they care about is, is uh, playing left if player one chose to the left of zero, right if player one chose to the right of zero. Player two either chooses left or right. She would like to match what eventually player three does. Player one, he wants three and four to match. He gets a big bonus, 10 if they match. Uh, he prefer it if two and three actually don't match. And he'd like to choose a, an action that's small in absolute value. Okay, so that's, that's what's going on. Now, this game, if you look at the payoffs, there's only one player who has infinitely many actions. It's player one. These payoffs are continuous in player one's action. 
Okay, so it's the structure of this game is, is really very nice. I mean, in technical terms, the action spaces of the players are compact, and the payoff functions as a function of all of the actions are continuous. It's, it's a lovely game, mathematically, one would think. Um, but I'm going to show you that this game, as lovely and simple and well-behaved as it looks, actually has no subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. Okay? So before showing you why that's true, why is that important? It's important because, uh, you know, if one is wanting to think about sequential equilibrium in infinite games, you, uh, every sequential equilibrium ought to be a subgame perfect equilibrium. And if we can't even get a handle on subgame perfect equilibrium in a game as simple and lovely as this, you know, what hope do we have? Okay, so, so th this was meant, this is an example which says, you know, there's really a problem here. Okay, so let me show you why it is in this game that there's no subgame perfect equilibrium. So the first thing I want to convince you of is that if there is a subgame perfect, let's suppose there is one, and then argue to a contradiction so that it can't be so. Um, if there is one, I'm going to argue that actually it has to be that, that, that player two, who chooses either left or right at date one, must be randomizing 50-50 on left right. If there's any hope for a subgame perfect equilibrium, two must be randomizing 50-50 left right. How to convince you of that? Well, suppose there's a subgame perfect equilibrium, and she's not randomizing 50-50. For example, suppose uh, that she's playing left with probability greater than a half. Okay, suppose left with probability greater than that. Let me argue that that can't be. Uh, so if she's playing left with a probability greater than a half, let's look now at player one's decision. Um, if player one, let's, let's think about player one choosing a positive number for the moment and, 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 and check player one's payoff. If player one chooses a number which is positive, so that's to the right of zero, remember that three and four will then strictly both want to play right. And so player one will get a payoff of 10 because three and four are definitely going to match one another. So that's good, so player, player one gets his 10. What else is player one concerned with? Well, remember the second thing he's concerned with is uh, whether or not two and three match one another. So now we know that three is going to play right, so it means if player two is choosing left with probability p, then it means she's choosing right with probability 1 minus p. And so player 2 and 3 will match with probability 1 minus p, and that's not good for 1. He doesn't want them to match. So with probability 1 minus p, he gets to minus his, his action. Um, but with probability p, player 2 does choose left, and so 2 and 3 mismatch because 3 is playing right. And so with probability p, player 1 gets the bump in his payoff of a1. But he is paying playing a, a positive number, and that's costly, he's going to lose that, the, the square of that. So that's, that's player one's payoff altogether here. And then it's a simple quadratic, we can, well, one can solve it, and, and, and uh, because p is bigger than a half, the uh, coefficient on, on um, a1 uh, here is positive, and uh, so actually this, uh, an optimal thing for one to do is to choose a positive value of a1. Negative values go the other way. It's, 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 a, it's, it's worse a payoff for him. Uh, and so the optimal thing and, and it, for player one to do is to choose A1, this P1 minus a half, and he actually gets a payoff which is strictly greater than 10 by taking this action. Notice that if he took the action A1 equals 0, then the best he could hope for, all of this stuff now doesn't matter. Uh, this would be zero, this part would be zero here for him. The only thing he could hope for would be to get a payoff of exactly 10, and he'd be hoping that three and four match, even though they're indifferent to choosing left and right, both of them. So by choosing this particular A1, which is positive, he gets a payoff which is strictly above 10, and he can't do any better than that. So the upshot here is if player two really is choosing left with probability P greater than a half, then the unique optimal choice for player one is to choose a pure action A1, which is bigger than zero. But if player one is choosing this action, this is supposed to be an equilibrium. If one is choosing an action which is strictly bigger than zero, it's to the right of zero, then of course three and four, we know, are going to both choose right. But if we know it, then player two also knows it. Player two knows that, that, that three is going to choose right. So player three should be 
uh, wants to, player two, who wants to match player three, should be playing right herself. Okay, so that's the contradiction. Evidently, player two is choosing left with probability bigger than half, but actually she could do strictly better by choosing right with probability one. Okay, so that tells us, aha, it can't be that player two is choosing left with probability greater than a half, and a similar argument says she couldn't be choosing right with probability bigger than a half either. So indeed, it has to be uh, that player two is choosing right and left with equal probability, one half, half one half. Okay, so, so we're led to, if there's an equilibrium, as I promised, um, it, the only possibility is that player two is mixing 50-50 on left-right here. Okay, so suppose she's doing 50-50. Where does that leave player one? Well, let's try again with player one. So again, we do the same sort of thing. Suppose player one takes a, a non-zero action. We sort of write down the same Pay a, a function uh, for him, and what do you see? We see here that, you know, because uh, player two is playing l right and left with probability 50-50, then um, players two and three, from, from player one's perspective, players, uh, player uh, uh, two is equally likely to match whatever player three does than not. And so player one gets, you know, that's a wash. Player one likes it when, when two and three don't match. He doesn't like it when, when two and three match, but, but that's a wash, 50-50, and that's going to go away. So actually player one's payoff ends up just being 10 minus the absolute value of, of his action. Now, he can get a payoff of arbitrarily close to 10 by taking any non-zero action. Uh, and by the way, why is he getting the 10? Right? Of course he's getting the 10 because players 3 and 4 are, are matching for sure when he takes a non-zero action. Um, but he can get a payoff arbitrarily close to 10. So in equilibrium, he must be getting a payoff of exactly 10. It wouldn't be in equilibrium otherwise. And the only way for him to get a payoff of exactly 10 is to choose A1 equals 0. Okay, so where are we now? Where, where, where we are is that the only hope for a subgame perfect equilibrium here is for player one to be choosing the action zero for sure, and for player two to be mixing 50-50 on uh, left-right. Okay? Moreover, player one's payoff has to be exactly 10 because he can get arbitrarily close to 10. So it must be exactly 10. And that means that, that in the continuation, players three and four must be matching one another, okay? Because any mismatch would give player one a payoff less than 10. Okay, so let's see, where are we? Okay, so, so where we are, here we, player one has to be taking the action zero, player two must be mixing 50-50 on left-right, uh, and players three and four, they have to be matching one another, yes? Yeah? So, they, so rega whether player two plays left or right, in this uh, continuation game, players uh, three and four are they playing left-left or right-right. Uh, and if player two chooses right, they must also be playing either left-left uh, or right-right. So that's, that's the situation. Now, can we make this an equilibrium? We have, there's some uh, selection we, we have... Uh, some flexibility there. So let's look at player two's payoff. Okay, I want to look at, in, in, given the actions of players three and four, I want to just focus on uh, player two's payoff. So we know in terms of the game, I'm just repeating here, that if two chooses left, if two chooses left, then she gets a payoff of one, and here's where those numbers matter. If, if player two chooses left, so here's the ch choice of left for player two, she gets a payoff of one if she matches player three, and she gets a payoff of minus one if she mismatches player three. What about when player two chooses right? Well, the, what we said there was if she chooses right, uh, then if, if, so her choice was right, if she matches player three, then she gets a payoff of two. If she mismatches, then she gets a payoff of three, uh, minus two, excuse me. So that's the situation. Now remember, players three and four, remember player one has to get a payoff of 10, so three and four have to, have to match one another. So the only choices we have for the payoffs that will result in this subgame are on the left, if player two chooses left, then either this is the payoff for player two, or this is the payoff for player two. Uh, if player two chooses right, either this is the payoff for player two, or this is the payoff of player two. But notice neither of the numbers payoffs for player two on the left are equal to either of the payoffs for player two on the right. 
That is, no matter how we make the selection here for what players three and four do, conditional on player two's choice, player two will not be indifferent between left and right. That's it. So player two, it gets no way to make this work so that player two's indifferent. Okay? So that may be more than you wanted to know about this example. Uh, but the upshot is that this is an extremely simple, well-behaved uh, example that one would think a priori it ought to be trivial to prove there's a subgame perfect equilibrium here. And yet, not only isn't it trivial, it's, it's false. Um, and, and so, you know, one thinks, well, if we can't handle games like this, I mean, how do you expect to prove, first of all, you have to define sequential equilibrium in infinite games, and then you have to prove, you know, better prove some sort of existence theorem. I mean, we're, we're it's, it's hopeless. Um, well, one could take that view, but, but, but we don't. And, and, and so what, what, what we, we think there's a way of thinking about this game that makes some sense. Uh, and, and really the way to think about it to, uh, and, and to provide an answer. And, you know, kind of a, a, a simple, natural, uh, naive perhaps way of thinking about this game is to, well, discretize it. There is this player who has infinitely many uh, choices, but let's discretize his action space. Uh, and so let's, let me take this particular discretization for the moment. Uh, this is player one's choice, discretized choice set. He can choose any uh, number in, in increments of one over m, and also minus one over m. So and as m gets large, that, that discretization becomes finer and finer and better approximates his, his original uh, action set. And of course, each of those uh, games is finite, and so we know there's a, at least a mixed strategy subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. And, and what you can show is that it, what's the structure of this equilibrium? It, it's, 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 I guess it's on the slide. And, and the, the equilibrium has the following uh, form. It's that player one chooses minus one over m with probability a half and plus one over m with probability a half in equilibrium. Player two is mixing 50-50 on left-right. Uh, and players three and four, well, when, if player one chooses plus one over m, that's a positive number, they both choose right. If he chooses minus one over m, they both choose left. So notice from player two's perspective at the first stage, uh, player three is equally likely to choose left or right. So player two indeed is indifferent between left and right. So all of this is hanging together. Uh, now you can imagine taking the limit. What happens in the limit? Notice that along the sequence, Players three and four, observing whether one shows a little bit to the right or a little bit to the left, can condition, and they do condition their actions on what player one is doing. But in the limit, what's happening to this signal? In the limit, of course, the, the, the probability distribution, well, it's minus one over and plus one. It's converging to zero, yes, with probability one. And suddenly at the limit, the signal disappears. And players three and four can no longer coordinate what they're doing. On, there's just no more signal on which to coordinate. So, but still, you know, as theorists, we, could take, we can look at the distribution over outcomes. If we just look at the distribution over outcomes in the limit, we, we get an answer. And the answer is in the limit, player one chooses zero, player two mixes 50-50, and players three and four are equally likely to, to, to choose left, left, and right, right. There's some correlation that sort of is produced in the limit. But it, that's the answer we would say is the answer. That's what Roger and I are going to say. That's the answer to this game. We want to say that's the way to think about this game. Okay, we are content to think about the solution to the game in terms of the probability distribution that it generates over outcomes. And a little more. You know, maybe you want to condition on other events that don't occur and look at the probability of outcomes conditional on those events too. That's okay also. But, but the upshot is that, that, that we're, we're not going to insist on a solution in terms of the player's strategies. Because the solution that we get here, which involves correlation between players two, uh, three and four, there are no strategies, yes, independent strategies for the players that could generate that outcome. So it's hopeless to look for a solution in terms of strategies. But it isn't hopeless to look for a solution in terms of probability distributions over outcomes, even conditional probability distributions over outcomes, conditional on probability zero events and such. Okay? So the lesson for us here is twofold. One is the way we're going to think about analyzing infinite games 
is in terms of finite approximations and taking limits of sensible equilibria, like sequential equilibria of finite approximations, and looking at the limits and really just looking not at the strategies because the, their limit strategies might not exist, but look at limits of uh, probability distributions over outcomes and maybe conditional probabilities. Okay, so that's, that's the important lesson that this uh, example gives us. Okay, so just, just a little bit on, on the structure of, you know, what are the class of games we're going to talk about, uh, just really informally. Uh, so nature will move, uh, she'll, she'll choose a theta according to some uh, prior. Um, the, the, the players, we're going to think of the finite n players moving simultaneously at each of uh, a, a finitely many dates of 1 through k. Um, and, but, but the information structure, don't think of this as a f as simultaneous move game where you find out everything that happened in the previous date. No, not at all necessarily. Um, there will be some history of play, nature's move, and then some sequence of actions that occurred before the date that, that you're playing at now. You're going to get some signal, some, and we're going to call it your type, but some abstract uh, signal that's going to, to provide some information about the history of play. Uh, could be that this function, tau ik, the signal you get, maybe it's a constant function. That is, no matter what happened in the past, you get the same signal or the same type, which means you have no information. Yes, you have, you're uninformed about the past. Um, it could also be the, the identity function. So whatever is the theta and the sequence of actions that occurred before, that's your type. You get that. So you have perfect information about the past. Um, we can analyze here, of course, perfect information games. It looks like we have players moving simultaneously, but of course it could be that the only player who has a non-trivial uh, move at any date is you, and, and, uh, or you at date, you player K at date K, and, and other players at other dates, so the only ones with non-trivial moves. So this is a very general, extensive form game setup. Uh, really the only sorts of things we're ruling out, and, and only for convenience really, are information sets crossing, that sort of thing. Other than that, it's completely general. So payoff functions, like the, probably the last time we'll see that, that letter V, but there they are. Um, and and, and uh, just, just uh, what's a strategy for a player? Well, strategy is a function. Well, strategies will come up uh, in an important way. Um, it the functions mapping your information, your signal, or what we, your type into an action uh, that, that is available to you at that, uh, at that date. Okay, so that's... that's now, uh, the other piece of notation we need to talk about is, is, you know, how are we describing a solution? As I said, solutions here are not going to be described in terms of strategies because that's just infeasible. That simple example told us that's infeasible. We're going to describe solutions in terms of um, probabilities over endpoints, or conditional probabilities, in fact. So, so, uh, so think of the, 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 the uh, an endpoint of the tree. Um, a play of the game, so nature makes a move theta, there's a bunch of sequence of actions, that's, that's an outcome of the game. A set of those, a collection of endpoints or outcomes, is a, what we'll call an outcome event. So, so Y is an outcome event. Um, and we we're interested to know, you know, as, as we're going to predict what's going to happen in a game, what's the probability of any outcome event? But we might also want to know, conditional on things that aren't supposed to happen, you know, what's the probability of an outcome event, if we're checking sequential rationality, those sorts of ideas. Um, and so if you're a player I at date K, you, know, you, you have a bunch of signals, a signal set, TIK, those are the things you might be informed of. Let's look at subsets, measurable sets, observable events for you, we'll call those QIKs. That's something that, that you can observe. Conditional on any such uh, event for you, I'm want to know what's the probability of an outcome event. An assessment gives answers to all of those questions. So for any uh, dated player, player I at date K, for any observable event QIK for that player, for any outcome event Y, an assessment gives the probability of Y conditional on QIK. So, so uh, an assessment is, you think of it as a, a really big vector of numbers between 0 and 1. For every subset y, for every q, i, i, uh, k, the, the mu gives a, uh, y given q, i, k gives a number between 0 and 1, a big vector of numbers. Um, well, but, but that's actually not so bad. It's, it's in the product topology, at least, that's, that's uh, the set of those things is going to be compact. 
Okay, and that compactness property, actually, that's where we get a toehold in terms of existence and, and, and limits. But, but we won't, you know, we're not going to dwell on that uh, today. Okay, so the, the, you know, the big, the question here uh, is, is um, you know, which assessments, mu, are we going to define as sequential equilibria of, of the game gamma? Um, and, you know, the naive answer is, well, of course, it's, it's we're going to look at finite approximations, that's what, that's what I promised, and we're going to take limits, and those are the things we're going to call sequential equilibria. But really, the, now, the, the, the heart of the matter here is, okay, but what's a, what are, what, what's a good approx finite approximation of an infinite game? How do you approximate an infinite? There are many ways you could think of doing it, um, and I have to say, inevitably, there's going to be some, one has to make uh, judgment calls. And Roger and I, uh, we make uh, our judgment calls. It, you know, how do we do it? You know, one has to look at examples, examples you think are canonical, important, are expressing some important uh, uh, general principle, um, and say, look, here's a game. This is telling us something about what are good approximations and bad approximations, and it's leading us down a path that we are, feel that we're forced to go, because if we don't approximate this way, this example gives us a, an answer we consider uh, not a good answer. So there's some subjectivity here, and, uh, and, and to the extent that, 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 that your intuitions differ from ours, um, uh, uh, by all means, um, you know, write a paper and, uh, <laughs> and, and send it to us. We'd be really, uh, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Um, okay, so how to approximate? Well, in some sense, it's obvious. You know, how should you approximate a, uh, with a, a finite game? Well, look, you have, you have uh, states. What, where are the infinities here? Maybe infinitely many states of nature, maybe infinitely many actions. But once you have, the, you know, take a finite subset of states, finite approximation of action spaces, then everything becomes finite. Yes, the, the types are then finite because you have these fi you have finitely many signals also. Um, so it sort of seems obvious how to do it. Well, actually, it's, no, it's not, not really obvious. There's, there's several problems there. One is that it's not at all obvious how to approximate nature if, if there are infinitely many states because you have this prior. And, and actually, if you're not careful, it's very easy, actually, and we're not going to talk about this today, but it's very easy to try to approximate an infinite state space and prior with a finite state space and an approximate prior, where actually you end up giving the players a lot more information than they had to begin with. Okay, so, so if you don't do that, it's very hard to do that without really changing the information structure. So, but let's abstract from that. Suppose even the state space is finite. So let's put that problem aside, serious problem aside for the second. Even then, so the only thing to approximate are the action spaces. Okay, so, uh, no, that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's, it's just not so obvious. And here's a really important, thing. We've, we found this example to be very important uh, in, in convincing us that that is not the right thing to do. So here's an example with a finite, uh, 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 where nature's um, state space is finite. So nature chooses either minus one or one. So theta is minus one or one, 50-50 each. Player one uh, observes nature. So that's the T1 uh, equals theta, means that's, that's player one's informational type. Uh, she uh, observes uh, theta and, and then chooses an action between minus one and one. What does player two observe? So after player one moves and after nature moves, player two observes the product of, of uh, nature and A1. And then player two gets to make a choice, either minus one or one, okay? What are the payoffs? So here are the payoffs. Notice that the payoffs actually don't depend at all on the action that player one takes on A1. So the first, by the way, the first coordinate here is player one's uh, payoff. The second coordinate is player two's payoff in each of the cells. Um, the payoffs don't depend at all on the action that player one takes. The payoffs only depend on what is nature and what action player two takes. Okay. Notice, so what is the structure of payoffs? Notice that player one, uh, regardless of whether nature is plus or minus one, Player one strictly prefers that player two take action two, action one, then action minus one. Player one gets a payoff of one if A2 is one, and gets a payoff of zero if A2 is minus one. OK? 
Okay, so player one always wants player two to take the action one. Okay, what about player two? Well, player two, if she knew nature, if he knew whether nature was minus one or one, she would like to match nature. Because if nature is minus one, player two gets a payoff of two if she takes the action minus one, and she gets a payoff of zero if she takes the action one. So she wants to match nature if nature is minus one. If nature is plus one, then player two gets a payoff of zero if she chooses minus one, and plus one if she chooses one. So again, she wants to match nature there. So if two knew the state of nature, she'd want to match it. The problem is she doesn't know the state. And actually, if she gets no information, right, a priori, the state is equally likely to be minus one as one. And so player two, if she chooses minus one, she gets an expected payoff of one. And if she chooses plus one, gets a payoff of a half. So without any additional information, player two is going to take the action minus one. OK? Remember, player one wants her to take the action plus one, no matter what. So player one would like to convince player two to take the action one somehow. Player one knows nature. He gets to send a signal. Uh, he gets to take an action. Uh, and you know, player two is going to receive a signal. So we want to know, you know, how do we analyze this game? What's, what's the sequential equilibrium of this game? Well, that's what we're trying to define, after all, yes? But I, so, so how do we think about def, you know, definitions? What are good definitions or bad? We have to first think of games and say intuitively, what do we think the equilibrium, in quotes, of this game should be? So I just want to try to convince you intuitively in this game, it should be, you know, it's ob I'll say obvious, but you shouldn't believe me. When I, whenever I say obvious, you shouldn't believe it. Uh, that, that player two, excuse me, player one, uh, should not be able to convince player two to take, ever, to take the action one. There should be no observation. There's no inf signal, T2, uh, that player two could receive that should ever convince her to take the action one. Why not? Well, notice that any number between minus one and one, so take the number, let's say, a, a, a third, okay? Take the number a third. Suppose that when player two sees a third as her type, she says, aha, that convinces me that the state is one. I'm going to take the action one. Player one says, fantastic. Why? Because no matter what the state is, whether it's plus one or if the state is plus one, player one can take the action a third and produce the signal a third and get player two to take the action one. But even if the state is minus one, player one can take the action now minus a third, again induce the, the signal plus one third and get player two to take the action one. So no matter, no matter what the state is, plus one or minus one, player one can generate any signal you want. So if there's any signal that would induce player two to take the action one, player one can generate that signal no matter what the state is. But then, you know, in that's not going to fly as an equilibrium. Player two will catch on to this. Okay, so intuitively, right, that, that this, this should, should not be possible. Okay, so now let's think about our naive approximation of this game. A naive approximation of this game would say, well, look, it's obvious what to do. Uh, discretize player one's action set, and, and away you go. They should look at the equilibrium. It's a finite game, and just look at the sequential equilibrium of that finite. Take limits, and that's, that's it. Let's all go home. Uh, well, let's, uh, but now we're in trouble. I'm going to give you a finite approximation that you're not going to like. Okay, well, at least that we don't like. Um, so, so, you know, let's say we have a finite approximation, and, and, but now suppose that it has the property that player one has an action uh, x, but not minus x. So you've, you've taken a discrete, a finite approximation of, of, of uh, a finite subset of minus 1, 1, and, you know, not so carefully. We've just done it so that, but he has a, x is in there, but minus x is not in there. Now suppose that player 2 actually gets the signal x. The only way in this, with this approximation that 2 could get the signal x is if player 1, uh, is if the state is 1. Yes, because look, player, play, notice that player 2, uh, player, the, absolute, player, the absolute value of player 2 is, is the absolute value of 1's action, because the state is either minus 1 or plus 1. So if player two's signal is x, it must be that the absolute value of one's action is x. But player one doesn't have minus x, so it must be that player one took the action x. But if that's my signal and he took the action x, the only way that could happen is if theta is plus one. Okay. 
So the, 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 the signal X is a credible signal that the state is one. But that means that, that, that we have an equilibrium. I'm sorry, let me just get that. Uh, that means that, that player one knows, take the, take the action X, player two is going to take the, uh, whenever I take the action X, if the state is one, I can take the action X, and that'll convince player two to, uh, to, um, uh, to take the action one. So I can signal that the state is one when it's one. Okay, uh, and we agreed that should never be put in you know, any sensible equilibrium should not have that property. So what's the conclusion? This is a bad way to approximate this game. Okay, it seemed obvious as maybe as a candidate for how to approximate, but actually we can't just do it in a willy nilly way. So so what to do? So well, what we have concluded after you know, so you have to, one has to do many examples, other things. What we've concluded that one has to do here is actually to coarsen player two's information. So actually, the way to approximate this game is not merely to approximate the action set of player one, but actually to also coarsen the information of player two. Notice that player two's type is anything between minus one, one in the original game. What we want to do is, is to look at a, take a finite partition also of player two's type space. Not just do that, but then Add actions, lots of actions for player one. So fix that finite partition of two's type space, and now start adding actions for player one. What could go wrong? What might go wrong is how could we get signaling to occur? One way to get signaling to occur there is that perhaps an element of two's partition can only be reached when the state is one. Then that would credibly signal to player two again that, that you know, the state is one and we're in trouble. But actually, if you have enough actions for player one for that fixed partition, then we're always going to be able to, any partition that can be reached when the state is one can also be reached when the state is minus one. So if you first fix a partition and then start adding actions for player one, you're going to get rid of this spurious signaling in this example. Okay, so this will be, this is actually what we are led to do. What we're led to do is to think about a, this, this sort of approximation. The sort of approximation is we're going to uh, consider finite partitions of the player's type spaces, their signal spaces, and then add actions quickly. Okay? And, and of course, we want the part finite partitions of the signal spaces to become very fine, but they're going to become arbitrarily fine uh, infinitely slower, so that is to say the, the actions are going to fill in the action spaces infinitely faster than the information, the, than the uh, type uh, partitions become infinitely fine. Okay, and that's all uh, as a result of this really important example. Okay. Six thirty, is it? Is this the one roughly, or 620, or something? 620, OK, thank you. Um, OK, so, so, so now that I've sort of described the kinds of approximations we're thinking about, let me say, well, not quite. Um, we're close. Uh, we're, it's not actually enough to just look at the action sets and then, so the idea that, that one wants to look at, you know, finite partitions of the signal spaces, the type spaces, and then think, look at the action spaces and, 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 and fill those in quickly, that's, that's okay, that's, that order of, of limits, that's the right idea. But, but focusing only on action spaces per se, that's actually not going to work. And I want to give you here an example that says action spaces, it's, it's not enough. One has, to, one has to go to strategies. Real, that's why I introduced the notion of a strategy earlier. Functions mapping your type, your, your signal into an action. One really has to look at strategies, not simple actions. So let, let's see what's going on. Um, Look at this example. It's an example. Uh, player one and, and two, they're going to move sequentially. Player one chooses an action, a real number between zero and one. And player two, you're, I'll be player one. I choose a number between zero and one. You, player two, you observe my action. That's why T2 is A1. T2 is, is your signal is my action. You, you observe my action, and then you get to choose a number between zero and one. Suppose the game's zero sum. Um, I win if, uh, if, if we don't match. You win if we match. Lucky you. I mean, I, 
I choose a number, you get to see it, and you know, if you match it, you win. I mean, uh, uh, okay, well, so you know, that seems like the obvious answer. The obvious answer is you win here, yes? Um, well, but, the, but, but, but now we're in trouble, actually. We're in trouble because we're led to do this, this you know, finite partitions and then fill in the actions infinitely more quickly. Look, let's, let's do that here. Let's see what trouble we get into. Uh, so we've agreed that you, know, you should win this. You should, you should be able to match me. But think of now a fixed partition of your type space. So your type space is, is, is my, you get to see my actions. Your type space is zero, one. Take a finite partition. Okay, so now you don't quite get to see my action. Um, if I, now we're going to fill in my action space. So we have finitely many actions. Each of us, we're going to fill in the actions given your fixed partition of what you can see. Uh, if I have enough actions, lots of, I have many actions within any element of your partition, I can mix between those. And there's no way you can, you, since it's, you know, you can't observe, uh, you can't distinguish between two distinct elements in your partition, uh, now you don't know what I'm going to do. And now I can win with arbitrarily high probability. If you add more and more actions for me, I can mix over all of them uniformly, and, and, and you're in trouble. Okay, so that's a bad approximation. We're in, we're in trouble there. But the reason it's bad is that actually we haven't included an important strategy for you. There's a strategy that you own in, this, in the original game, which is a fu function which says, match what Phil does. Just do what Phil, this function that maps your type, which is my action, it's the identity function. What you see is what you do. Okay. So if instead of just th approximating you know, the things that are available to you with ordinary actions, we say, no, 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 no. actually, let's let you do, uh, you have a strategy set, and let's, let's just fill in your strategy set with the strategies that you have available. Once we include this strategy for you, it doesn't matter what your information partition is, you're going to win this game. You just use this strategy. You don't have to know anything. Uh, you just use it, and you win. Okay. So that's what we're actually led to do. Okay? We're led to think about approximating games in the following way. We're an infinite game by a finite game. How? We're going to take finite partitions of the player's signal spaces, their type spaces, and finite subsets of their strategy spaces. And that's going to produce for us a finite game. Okay? And then we're going to look at limits of those, of, of, of sequential equilibria of those finite games as the strategies, finite strategy sets fill in the original strategy sets infinitely faster than the finite type partitions become arbitrarily fine. So, a little bit of notation. Uh, a strategy set approximation is just, a, is a, we call it a C, which is going to be the product. So we're going to take each of your strategy sets. A strategy set in the original game is S, I, K, for player I at date K. These are functions from your type into your actions. Um, C, I, K is a finite subset of, 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 of your strategy space, and the product of all of those C, I, Ks is, is C. So that's, that's a finite uh, uh, strategy set approximation. And of course, large, well, of course, we're going to say larger sets are better approximations. Okay, so larger finite sets are better approximations to the true set of strategies. Uh, what's a type set approximation? Well, it's, it's what I've said. We're just putting a bit of notation to it. For each player at, at each date k, you have a type set, tik. We're going to look at a finite partition of your type set, and that's a pi ik for you. The product of those is a, is a pi. So pi is a, is a a type set approximation, and it's a product of finite partitions of the, of the player's type spaces. And of course, finer partitions are better. So if you give me a strategy set approximation C and a type set approximation pi, that gives me a finite approximation of the game. Okay? So the pi and a C a partition and a, and a, and a it's finite strategy sets, that gives me a finite approximation of the game. And so now I have a finite game, and I can talk about its sequential equilibria. So let me do that briefly. So we have a finite approximation of the game. So what do we have here? There's a bit of a mouthful. Um, 
I'm going to define what we call an epsilon approximate sequential equilibrium for this finite game, this finite approximation pi c. So what is it? So fix an epsilon. So you give me an epsilon positive. You probably want to make it small. Uh, and, and we'll say that, that sigma uh, is an epsilon approximate sequential equilibrium if, if it's totally mixed. So what is sigma? So remember, we have this, this, uh, uh, this, fi this finite game. What is it? Well, you have, um, suppose you're a player i and the date is k. You have finitely many strategies available to you there. Uh, they're they're uh, strategies you had available in the original game, but you have, it's a finite set that's available. You can decide which ones of those you want to use. You can mix over them. Yeah, so so, so si a sigma for you, sigma ik, is a, is a probability distribution over the, 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 the strategies, the finitely many strategies that are available to you, and the sigma is a profile of those, of those strategies. So that's what sigma is. We want it to be totally mixed, um, and, and to be an epsilon approximate sequential equilibrium, uh, no player uh, um, conditional on any element of his finite type set par uh, partition can gain more than epsilon by deviating to some strategy in his finite strategy set approximation. So, so what's going on? It's a mouthful. What's going on? Uh, we have, for at each date, your player i, it's date k, you've got a finite partition of your, of your type set. You've got finitely many strategies to choose from. You, you can mix over those finitely many strategies any way you want, um, and you can do it, you know, conditional actually on any, on any partition. Conditional on any partition element, you can choose this mi mixture over the strategies you have available, and on another element, choose another mixture over the strategies you have available. What we want to make sure of, to be such an equilibrium, that conditional on any element of your partition, um, actually, you can't do better by more than epsilon by choosing some, you, you like your mixed strategy at least as much, uh, uh, and you can't do epsilon better by choosing some other strategy that's available to you in the finite approximation, okay? So it's really very, it's really a finite game, and just like a finite game, and any finite approximation has an epsilon approximate sequential equilibria. Now, why do we talk about epsilon approximate sequential equilibria? Why not regular just sequential equilibria of this game? And the, re and the answer is, well, we could, uh, but then we'd have to introduce beliefs. Yes, because uh, in a sequential equilibrium has a behavioral profile, system of beliefs. This is actually equivalent. Any, take any finite game, take any sequential equilibrium with its beliefs and behavioral strategy profile. Um, there is an epsilon, for any, abs, take, there is a sequence of epsilon approximate sequential equilibria, and those are just strategies that will converge to the behavioral strategy profile in the sequential equilibrium, and vice versa. Any sequence of epsilon approximate sequential equilibria uh, uh, correspond to a sequential equilibrium. The limit is, 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 gives you sequential equilibrium strategy. So they're really equivalent. It just it means that we don't have to talk about beliefs. Okay, that's, that's a mouthful. Okay. So as promised, you know, the idea then is we're going to consider limits of such equilibria as the finite strategy set approximations fill in the true strategy spaces infinitely faster then the type partitions become arbitrarily fine. Good. Well, you'd think that would be enough, wouldn't you? I mean, you know, it should be. It's we've worked so hard. Uh, oh gosh, but no. But it's just it just goes on and on. Um, let's see what goes wrong. So 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 we're committed. We are committed to this idea of this order of limits and 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 approximating games in this way, but darn it, uh, why isn't it enough? And what 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 do we have to do about it? Let's go back to this important example. The 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 example where nature is either -1 1, one, one um, player 1 observes nature, uh, player 1 can take an action between real number between -1 one and 1 and player 2 sees the product of 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 nature's uh, choice and, and one's choice, and she has to choose either minus one or one. And player one, no matter what nature is, he wants her to choose plus one, uh, but she really needs some information uh, to, to choose plus one. Otherwise, she's gonna choose minus one. So that was the example we analyzed before. Um, but but, but uh, now we actually have a procedure. We've, we've, we've committed ourselves to a real procedure for approximating this game. And it involves using strategies, not ordinary actions. Okay, so let's see. So uh, first fix a, a partition and then start filling in strategies, okay? 
Okay, so, so the partition, just any finite partition will do. It's not going to bother me which one you take. So fix a, a finite partition for player two, and then let's start adding strategies, okay? And of course, the more strategies, the better, supposedly, yes? So suppose you start adding strategies, and you say, here's a big strategy set, Phil. It's finite, and you know, I think this is a pretty good approximation. And I say, look, I'm going to give you an even better approximation, and I'm, let me add some more strategies, and that's even better. And then I'm going to say, aha, look at now you have a t bad, there's an equilibrium here that we don't like. All right, so uh, uh, fix a, uh, any finite partition for two and take any finite set of strategies that, that you've given me, as many as you like. And you're saying this is, I'm going to add more, make it an even better approximation. So what am I going to, I'm going to, you can always add um, another strategy for player one uh, that does what? Well, let's, let's be careful about this. So you've given me finitely many strategies for player one. He only has finitely many strategies. Nature, is, what's a strategy for player one? It's a function mapping nature into an action for player one. Nature is either minus one or one. So any strategy you give me takes at most two outcomes, has, takes at most two actions. Maybe it takes the same action if whether or not nature chooses minus one or one, but it, it takes at most two actions, maybe a different action for minus one, a different action for plus one. You've given me finitely many strategies for player one, so altogether you're using up finitely many actions that are available to player one between minus one and one. I'm going to pick an action x that you haven't used yet. Okay, so this x is an action that so far is, uh, is never the outcome of any strategy that player one has available. That's the x right here. So I'm going to add a strategy that does what? That when the state is 1, sends the action x. When the state is minus 1, does some other action. I don't care. So notice, if player 1 has this strategy, uh, and the type that player 2 sees is x, the only way that can happen is if the state was 1. So seeing x actually is a credible signal of the state. So if I give player 2 a strategy, that when she sees x, she does take the action plus 1. And when she sees something else, she doesn't. Uh, then together, C1 and, if they both use c1 and c2, this will be an equilibrium. And it'll have the property that when the state is 1, player 2 is taking the action 1, which is exactly what we said should never happen. OK, so, so here we are again, same trouble. After all this work, we're back to where we started, it seems. So what to do? OK, I think this is a good point to just say what to do and not to do more. Uh, so, so the key, uh, the, 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 the what to do is actually to, to add, to require that if, to, to call something a sequential equilibrium, uh, it actually must be independent of the order in which strategies are introduced. So notice that what's going on here is that you guys first gave me a finite set of strategies, and then I added this particular strategy profile here that upset everything. Yeah, so introducing the order in which these strategies are is pretty important. This has to come last. I can't now let you guys add more strategies, because if I did and, and you did, uh, this would disappear. Because we could always add a strategy for player one, say that, that when the state is minus one, he also does x, and then, uh, or minus x. Uh, and then the signal x could come out whether or not the state is plus one or minus one, and that would, that would, that would get rid of this spurious signaling that was going on. So actually, if we insist that something that we call a sequential equilibrium not only has to come from limits in the order that we said, partitions, strategies are filling in the strategy sets infinitely faster than the partitions are becoming arbitrarily fine. But also, no matter what order we put in the strategies, introduce the strategies, actually one gets rid of this as an equilibrium. And the only thing that does survive, and it does survive, is the no signaling equilibrium in this example. OK, so we will take that on faith for the moment. And then what you, what's also going to be important for this to have any use for us is that there's a reasonably general existence theorem, that, that under reasonable conditions some involving compactness, continuity, some regularity in terms of information, some of that related to, if one, uh, for those who know it, the, the, the Milgram-Weber uh, absolute, continu uh, absolute continuity condition, um, 
gives a reasonably broad set class of extensive games where actually this, this, you do get existence of such a thing that we'll call a sequential equilibrium assessment that, that, that's not, that, that you get as the iterated limits, and actually it's a real limit, meaning that the order in which you take the limits doesn't matter, the things introduced. Um, and, and just, uh, you know, we will just flash um, uh, that that's, this means almost nothing uh, to, to us at the moment. But this is, this is the idea, this is the iterated limit idea. The, the, what is this thing? Well, it's nothing. It's, I'm just, you know, one shouldn't just throw notation on the board. But there is a theorem here in, in words, okay? So this is what it means, this is what it means for mu to be a sequential equilibrium. It's what I said, it, it's, it's, it's the, iterate, the iteration is there. You see that we're taking limits of the partitions on the slow outer limit, the limits of the C is in the faster inner limit. And this letters that follow have some meaning. Uh, and, and we have a theorem that says, yes, there's such, a, such an assessment uh, exists under uh, reasonable conditions. And, um, and um, I'm sorry, but that's the best I can do. Thank you very much. <laughs>